Winston Churchill he ran a very good war campaign, but the problem was that he didn't really think about what would happen after the war. Up until this point, you'd had the Conservative Party leading for like pretty much since like the end of World War One, yeah, for the most part. And it was a thing where the Labour Party had only just started to kind of come up. The Labour Party was founded in 1900 and it had been elected very briefly on a minority government between the years 1924 and 1929. However, that wasn't very successful under Randy MacDonald. Up until that point, the narrative had always been that Labour cannot govern. However, during the war, the government uh, formed a national co coalition between the Conservatives, the Labour Party and all the other uh, parties. So in that context, people saw that actually Labour could be part of a government and actually the Labour leader, uh, Clem Attlee, ended up becoming the Deputy Prime Minister during the time when, you know, when Churchill was Prime Minister. So while Churchill was focusing on the war, Attlee was focused on the home front. It kind of debunked the whole myth of socialists can't run a government. By 1945, people were weary from war. They wanted the so-called like home fit for heroes, which had been promised at the end of the last world, uh, world war. It was time for a change, right? And actually you can see this in the opinion poll from about 1942 onwards. It shows Labour pretty much consistently being ahead of the Tories. Churchill got defeated in, in July of 19. 1945 because he basically thought oh okay well I'm, I'm the war hero like, of course they you know, they love me like kind of this cheering crowd of course they're gonna vote for me actually that campaign ended up being very ugly the time when people throw through eggs at him because the thing is what you have to understand about Churchill is up until 1940 he was a complete failure like everything that he'd done had pretty much just been a kind of a shambles like kind of Gallipoli campaign which we'll probably get into on, on a future video as to what would happen if Gallipoli had succeeded because in theory the thing is with Churchill a lot of his ideas in theory work but in practice they didn't actually work and it's a thing of he didn't listen to people who said why it wouldn't work because uh, he was like oh well we'll just get on with it anyway and uh, yeah so because of that kind of attitude it meant that he wasn't like that great of a kind of leader as such yet so people were very hesitant for instance to make him prime minister in 1940 because of all of like the, the, the past before yeah uh, never mind that all the the labor uh, relation things you know like sending 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 troops to try and like, like crush like Kind of like trade union strikes you know it's really 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 unpopular kind of like stuff here like kind of, especially with like the average like working person in, in the country so when it came to 1945 people booted him out we know through like through hindsight obviously that six years later he got elected again so he was, he was prime minister in 1940 to 1945 and also 1951 to 1955 however within those six years the Labour party under Clamatley came in with a stonking majority and they were able to implement a lot of the things which even today in 2020 we still have such as the NHS, such as the welfare state etc etc. The point is this, if he had started putting in some more policies and clearly kind of like shown a vision for the country rather than just being like I'm the war leader you know reward me for everything I've done a war leader is fine but when the war's over we don't we, we need someone who can lead in peace right is, is the old thing of like, what Tony Benn said yeah this is what this is what I said before if you can plan for war why can't you plan for peace yeah why like if you can have full employment killing Germans why can't you have full employment uh, you know building schools and hospitals and stuff right this was the the general vibe of the country in 1945 and Churchill was so tone deaf to us because he's so focused on the war that he couldn't actually recognize that's what people wanted. However, I do want to uh, dispute a narrative here, which is that if Labour hadn't won in 1945, then you wouldn't have had any sort of welfare state at all at all. And that, you know, we would have lived in some sort of Mad Max, like kind of anarcho-capitalist, crazy, crazy land. It wouldn't have been a return to some Dickensian, like kind of novel, right? It wouldn't, it just wouldn't have happened like that. In 1942, you had the so-called Beveridge Report, which was like created by, uh, by Lord Beveridge. And so he basically looked into lots of different things and thought, and he recognised that actually what the country needed was a welfare state that dealt with health, dealt with like dealt with lots of different things. All of the major parties, yeah, whether it's like kind of whether it's conservatives, uh, Labour, like and liberals, all decided because Beveridge was a liberal himself, right? All of them like actually got behind this idea of after the war we need to like build up more of a welfare state. And it's also important to remember that the very first sort of 
welfare state that was actually created in Britain, Churchill had a massive part to play in that. Like, so back in the, the People's Budget of 1909, Winston Churchill and Lloyd George, both of whom, uh, well, Churchill at that point was a liberal, not conservative, he hadn't switched party yet. Both of them really railed against the establishment, railed against the House of Lords, changed the, the constitution with regard to the power of the House of Lords to, 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 like, to, to kick back uh, policies and stuff. With that People's Budget, it had the first thing of relief for the poor, of a pension system, the first inklings of kind of like of a welfare state. Winston Churchill is not this person who doesn't care about the, about the plight of the poor at all. And if you look at the 1945 Conservative Manifesto, what you find is what they're proposed for, instead of the NHS is what you have in pretty much all other European countries. Now, people in Britain and people in America, here's the thing, there are more than two healthcare systems in the world. Mind blown, right? Because everyone in Britain knows about the alternative in America, and everyone in America knows about the alternative in Britain. But they completely, you know, so they go, oh, either we need to have the government running all healthcare, or we need to have the private sector running all healthcare. Actually, most countries in the world have a mixture of both. And actually, so you have, so the beverage model is the one that we have here in Britain, whereby uh, you have the um, you have the state running the healthcare system, running the hospitals, running, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then you've got the Bismarckian one, right? So Bismarck uh, was the German ch chancellor uh, like, kind of at the, the time when, when Germany uh, was first unified. He was an old, like, conservative. However, he recognised the, the, the growing power of socialism in his country. And so he in, in, uh, adopted many of the policies like that the socialists wanted in order to kind of, like, ease the, the, the need for, uh, for like, an like, uh, uprising. So he implemented the, the world's first like kind of like proper like welfare state as we know it today. With that kind of model, when it comes to healthcare, you should have private institutions, private healthcare, but it's subsidized. You know, the poorest people are subsidized by the state, right? And in that way, it's a thing of everyone has private health insurance, but it's it's covered. So you have universal coverage, but the state jumps in only when 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 it needs to. This is very much the model that we would have had if Churchill had. Had, had won the war so you wouldn't have had the NHS as we know it today and it wouldn't have become this almost like kind of like like uh, this, this secular religion in this country yeah, where people kind of go we love the NHS etc so it would have just been another government agency where people would have had no like deeper ties to and so as a result we would have had yeah we our healthcare system would have been pretty much like Germany and pretty much like the every other healthcare system on the continent the other major area of nationalization that the Labour government pushed though, in 1945 was the nationalization of major industries, of utilities, etc. Et so the railways, coal, steel, uh, shipbuilding, planes, uh, kind of uh, tele uh, like telecom, like everything, yeah, was all nationalised by the government. This is very different again from what was done in other countries. So martial aid, which was given by the, by the US to the different like European countries, which obviously had suffered greatly in the war, most other countries used the money from that through private means. Uh, so for instance, Germany was able to very quickly like kind of like uh, um, uh, reindustrialise and end up becoming like, by the fifties and sixties end up becoming like an economic powerhouse. You see the same, same thing in Japan. Britain, however, it was the, the largest recipient of Marshall A plan because obviously the Americans wanted to help their ally out, right? To rebuild after the war because we were devastated. We spent a big, big chunk on that paying for, for nationalization. But when the government is the em, like is the employee, economic efficiency gets put out the window because then the day it's all about keeping jobs because you keep jobs, yeah, then you keep people like voting for you and stuff, right? And if all of a sudden you end up losing those jobs for whatever reason, then people end up like punishing you at the ballot box. So you end up being held hostage yeah like to to the workers in, in certain industries if we look at like coal if we look at steel if we look at a lot of these industries yeah right the 1940s yeah the late 1940s we end up seeing this nationalization by about the 1970s or actually we start to see even more of this like in the 60s and, and bit by bit like it becomes more and more of an issue by the 70s we start to see these industries becoming ever more inefficient ever more cumbersome ever more like kind of not keeping up with the times but at the same time the government couldn't just rip the bandage off in the early 70s yeah, the miners strikes end up like you know crippling the government the government end up basically like losing like kind of the 1974 election as a result of this the trade unions they had them hostage basically because of all the the industrial strife that came out of that period and the fact that 
Britain was falling behind and etc etc two things end up happening one we end up joining the common market yeah which later became the EU so in 1973 because of the oil shop because of all the internal strife the idea was actually us joining the the EEC and then in, which was what it was called in those days that is the only way for us to be able to revamp our, like, our economy for us to kind of like uh, to liberalize a bit and to and to kind of vote and to move and to move all the time because France and Germany and Italy and all these other places have liberalized their markets and now like they're doing they're doing fine so the idea was if you implement like kind of like that the, the policies that come from the EEC then we can do it however if our industries had been good because they hadn't been nationalized beforehand then it would have been a thing where actually we were we were said probably not because if we didn't join in that exact moment in 1973 it's unlikely that we would have and actually we're going to get into this in a in in the next video which is going to be what if Britain hadn't joined the EU lots of lots of history that's very interesting with that so there's that we probably wouldn't have joined the eu and all the implications that come with that the second one is this margaret thatcher ends up coming elected in 1979 all the policies that she pretty much ends up implementing are a reversal of not everything that came out of the, that atley government but a lot of it quite a significant chunk of it right and a lot of it was due the privatization of these nationalized industries to have to do that in the 1980s first of all she had the support of large segments of the country who by that point had been sick of of, of the of the trade unions that like kind of basically having the country by the balls right but it ended up being quite a relatively violent reaction to what had been there because of that the the the, the, the tensions between north and south between conservative and labor etc etc really didn't really start to shake up until like the modern era really with, with like the 2019 election where you know you had certain like mining communities which i know we're never ever voting in tory and it's literally only just because of like the brexit like kind of debate that they're even con that they've even considered switching so because of that it left a very nasty kind of taste and a very nasty legacy as such right it's very divisive the fact is that actually if you hadn't nationalized those industry in the first place you wouldn't have had all that division you wouldn't have had to have this kind of like uh, rip the bandage off kind of like mentality yeah, and like which just left those communities scarred because the mines were being shut the inefficient railway uh, uh, lines were being like kind of like got rid of but it was done at far too slow of a rate and it wasn't keeping up with what was economically viable, right? And that was the problem with nationalized industries because if the taxpayer can bail it out, it's gonna be bailed out, right? And the more that the trade unions clamor for it, yeah, the, the, the higher their wage is gonna go, the more cost is there, et cetera, because they know that the government's not going to run out of money, but a private businessman would, right? So this is the point that, so when you have nationalized industries like this, it ends up leading to a lot of inefficiencies over time. If we had followed the model that like that Germany and many other places have taken, we would actually have a lot more of a moderate um, uh, kind of like political spectrum, a lot more moderate of a debate. And so like, you know, so the conservatives and, and Labour would have been a lot more kind of centrist as such, yeah. Like much as you see in Germany today, with um, uh, 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 um uh, with the CDU um and the SPD, um, you know, they're they're relatively centrist. Yeah, you don't have one going off this way and another going off the other way. It would have made British politics a lot more calm, basically, d during during the late twentieth century.